when you start really talking about emotion and with Steve and the research that you have been doing, um, why? Like, why do you look into the emotional context? Because a lot of my students are very interested in emotion and creating projects around that. But I'm interested now as a researcher, if you really look at data and have so many issues in terms of really identifying the emotion, like why do you then look at it? You mean why do we still try to measure it? Uh, why have we not given up yet? Um, <laughs> uh, well, I think part of, we do, so why do we, do you mean, when you say emotion, do you mean at the self-report level? Mm -hmm. Um, I think there are some really interesting parts of that. There are sometimes when people say, first, the absence of emotion is an interesting thing. Um, so one of the things we do a lot of in our lab is um, do things that most people are scared by, and then what we're really interested in is the people who, are, who have no response to those scary things at all. Um, so that's one thing that we focus on a lot about. And, and Steve, maybe you want to talk about guilt and shame and why we look at that. And you know, I, I study guilt and shame, which are very sort of similar constructs. But when you look at sort of the data related to guilt or shame, guilt is really much better for you. Um, shame is a pretty destructive emotion when you feel too much of it. A little of it is fine. Uh, but one of the things that we found is that there's, there's sort of a discrepancy between, in the physiology between people who will report shame and people who won't report shame. Uh, and we use sort of other sort of tricky ways of getting them, of figuring out that they're ashamed when they won't report shame. But I think in general, you know, we're a clinical psychology lab. And what we're interested in is there, there's something about people who there's a discordance between what they're reporting and then what we see physiologically. That seems to be sort of clinically interesting and related to the different sorts of psychopathologies that we're interested in studying. Modern anxiety we would see in somebody who's kind of um, answering the questions quite directly, but kind of fidgeting, perhaps um, taking a pause before um, responding, as compared to somebody who just seems very relaxed, their, their responses come out um, very easily, they seem to have access to those representations, or it seems to be quite familiar with, within them, as compared to somebody who is more severely anxious, um, who has a lot of trouble getting coherent response out, is fidgeting a lot, is biting their lips, hand to mouth, all kinds of gestures that we know is an indication of, of anxiety. You might look up somebody named Johannes Bieringer, who's working in London, I think, B-I-R-R-I-N-G-E-R, -R -E because he has been working with um, uh, dance, and uh, wearables uh, uh, for wearable technologies for a long time and, and, and has used it, um, used dance as a way to sort of explore uh, phenomenological questions, maybe not psycholo scientifically psychological, but um, so you might find some of that, some of what he's written. Johannes Beringer, B I R R, I think it's I N G E R. Um, and he really comes to mind, but there are a lot of people, but I would st I'd start there. There's also a doctoral student at the New School, a woman named Eliza Monti, who works with Emanuele Castano in psychology, who is studying register changes in the voice and singer at singers as related to moments of stress, anxiety, or sort of personal re revelation. And there's some very easy to use software that is available for that kind of work. Have you heard of Paul Ekman? Yeah, he's, so he's one of the main researchers in nonverbal communication, um, and he's developed a very elaborate coding system to look very specifically at um, facial movements and um, just, you know, things like what Steve was talking about, just certain things that um, will indicate an emotion that you can't even necessarily see or notice right away with the naked eye. Um, so he's, he's written a bunch of books and he has a kind of fun website. Um, and in, in our lab, we've, we have been looking at the mirror interview um, with a nonverbal coding system that I developed based on um, someone named April Trees did a, did a similar coding system. And um, looking at facial expression, body movements, um, which included sort of posture and some of the agitated movement that Miriam was talking about that we see in um, anxiety. 
and uh, voice, you know, voice levels and tone. Um, and what else? Face, body, voice. Yeah, lip lip adapters was a was a big one. It's when you bite your lip or um, lick your lips or something like. People do it so much without realizing it, and it was something that we noticed a lot in the mirror interview. Oh, and also self-touch. So this was something that we found um, happened a lot in the mirror interview, where people were sort of tugging on their clothes or pulling on their hair, or um, I probably I probably have been doing this while I've been up here, actually, just sort of like holding onto my wrist. I'm a little nervous. Um, so those kinds of things we we take a close look at. There's some work on um, using EEG to distinguish things. So when you're when something is familiar with you, you're for you, you have a specific type of brain wave called a P3. If it's or if it's unfamiliar, you get a P3. Um, and if you so the your the, one of the paradigms that's used is presenting information, for example, that only a criminal would know, um, and looking at whether people have that response to that information relative to other information. But it's not terribly reliable. But to give an example of how this stuff can go wrong, there's a guy named Rich McNally who conducted a study in which he took a bunch of people who claimed that they'd been abducted by aliens and showed that they had a heart rate response similar to people who believed that they had been abused as children. He interpreted these data as saying sexual abuse in childhood is about as likely as being abducted by an alien, um, <laughs> which is pretty backwards if you ask me. What is most likely is that people who are abducted by aliens have probably reconfigured the memory of childhood trauma as something that is no longer abuse. So there's a ton of misapplication of this stuff too. It's not, it's not at a place where it's reliable or trustworthy at all. Um, I think in our work, looking at issues around narrative and qualities of coherence really gets to the honesty. So somebody gives you a response on, on the surface, which says, you know, oh, I really like how I look, um, but then um, lets the coherence slide or their perturbations to their narratives um, really is, are, are pretty good indications of issues around honesty. And so people who are very flexible and can give um, a range of responses without contradicting themselves um, as they go through their narrative, and then also comparing the verbal response with the nonverbal, I think gives you an indication of how true that is for that individual. All right, next question. What? Right here? Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, so I, there, there are some applications which I don't know, it, it's one application where that, that might be a uh, uh, possibility. So there, um, People who are trying to recover from substance dependence will often have very strong urges or cravings, and there's actually uh, researchers, I think, in Buffalo, who um, so and those those urges or cravings are strong emotional responses that reliably give a skin conductance response. And so what happens is um, somebody wearing this device will get an urge or craving, and a little buzzer will go off, or something will ring that says like you're having a craving, and then here are the tools that you've already been taught to deal with your cravings. So uh, that is a very different approach than something like a medication that tries to reduce urges or cravings. So I do think that there are some applications at least. Yeah, even here at the new school on the third floor in the counseling center, um, there's somebody doing um, very impressive biofeedback work, which used to, was like from the 70s, um, that we've actually been in contact with because she's um, really caught on to a way where you indicate to the individual what their body is doing and they can actually help regulate themselves in accordance to what they're, they're seeing in terms of the evidence, a little bit like what Stephen is, is um, suggesting. So we do think that there is um, a lot of applications and I think there's that whole huge mindfulness industry that's also trying to connect to feeding back something about being present and using different ways of regulating oneself um, without the use of pharmaceuticals. There are two pieces on the research front. I would look at Matthew Goodwin's work at Northeastern University, and he worked with Rosalind Picard at MIT Media Lab. Um, he was her postdoc, now he's faculty um, at Northeastern in Boston. Um, the other place is stuff like, um, there's some EEG um, reading things to show when someone is engaged or disengaged, or conversely, to help people who have autism tell when they've, 
or some maybe something more like mild autism um, tell when they've talked maybe in a way that has led someone to no longer be interested. Um, so uh, as a way of training people to start to recognize signals. Um, and so like one example of a device like that is called the Neko Mimi, um, which is kind of a hilarious pair of cat ears that start to like perk up if someone is interested and then sort of like sag as someone becomes disengaged. And they, they talk about putting these on, <laughs> the, the sort of like a, a friend who was doing a study beginning to put these on um, masses of um, uh, engineers all trying to work together um, <laughs> to help them learn about um, the body signal, like the, to help them sort of start to know, oh, when your face does this and your cat ears do that, it probably means I should stop talking. Yeah. yeah, that's a very good question. So basically, um, it is extremely important to actually look at the social context, uh, in particular when you look about uh, something like a Google Glass or something that actually is a camera and thus captures data from the person across you, right? That's what you're talking about. So um, absolutely. So what, what I think um, is, re is required, I mean, this is one set of research that we do here, but we definitely need to take the social implications and the communication studies into account when we actually start wearing technology that not only affects us, but also others. What is that effect that others actually have by us wearing it? And or what is uh, the, um, uh, the level of, um, of intimacy that can actually happen because somebody now understands that you are wearing it or so. So that's why also it's very important to understand intimacy and in, 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 you know, really understand uh, communication theory in a, much more, in a much deeper context. But also that has a lot to do in looking into social media and uh, the exposure of actually uh, personal data in that context, Those, you still think it is in the box. So uh, you still think it's quote unquote safe versus you know you suddenly have the information or you suddenly have that technology on you and it's very obvious for that other person that you are capturing data and you're taking a photo or a video versus it, it shall not be probably as obvious when you take it with your camera, with your phone, and then you upload it, though it's still out there. So I think there are lots of different layers that are still yet to be, um, to be really researched. So for particular, when you were referring to Google Glass, you were referring to augmented reality and so forth. So that's like an, a complete different set of, um, um, of technology we have to look at. Thank you very much for coming here. Thank you very much for Paul to organize this. And uh, thanks very much for the panel.